Thank you so much. So we are kind of the what did we learn from all this panel? And I think we'll you know, touch on some lessons that could specifically be learned, but also like where, where do we go from here and how depressed should we be or <laughs> can we find a silver lining to all this? But I'll just start you off with like very briefly, what do you think, what role did gender play in this and the kind of dynamics and strategies? And do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So I think there were two, um, I, I'm one role, there were two roles on, on um, obviously the Republican like side and the Democratic side and the, the, the Democratic side I would say, Look, I mean, Hillary Clinton herself said she was a very flawed candidate. Um, you know, she was she didn't she wasn't the same sort of campaigner as as Barack Obama was or as her husband was. But I also think that she did suffer from um, sexism uh, that existed on the campaign trail, and we're just not used to hearing powerful women. So, um, you know, Bernie Sanders could yell at you for like forty minutes, and you'd be like, "Yeah, yell at me for forty more." And um, and Hillary would raise her voice, and everyone would be like, "Oh my God, she's so shrill! Like, why is Mom screaming at me?" Um, and so there was, you know, there's that. I mean, it's going to take us, I think, a good generation of powerful women raising their voice and passion, um, talking about how they're really inspired to change the world in order for us to become accustomed to that and not think that they're shrill and, shrill and screaming. I think there's also a lot of challenges that women still face with executive leadership, um, sort of proving that they're tough enough while still remaining likable um, and being able to soar in ways that men can soar. So Barack Obama could talk every day about the arc of the moral universe bending towards justice, and you're like, wow, that's so inspirational. <laughs> Hillary really, you know, it was very hard for her to reach altitude um, and with her speeches, and you saw that um, with, like, for example, even her convention speech, people talked about how Michelle Obama's was so much more inspiring than Hillary's, um, why Hillary wasn't smiling enough during her convention speech. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's frankly a, a, a sort of symptom of a lot of women running for executive office. If you think about women leaders in the world already today, Angela Merkel, <laughs> Theresa May, uh, Margaret Thatcher, I mean, these are not leaders who are soaring female orators. They're very pragmatic. And that is the role that we expect that we elect women in is this almost like motherly role where um, they're very pragmatic. They're they're sort of uh, the ones who sort of steal the spine of the you know of, of the nation and get and march on through whatever problem that is, um, and and it's not the sort of ins inspirational roles that. Um, that you see in, in most world leaders. And I think that's something that women are gonna have to you know, overcome and, and really that's one of the big barriers. On the, on the Republican side, um, I thought it was really interesting that sort of non-college educated uh, white women, and I wish there was another way to say that because it always comes off as sounding like they're not educated, like they're dumb or something, and they're not dumb um, at all, and I want to sort of say that, but just the, the demographic of non-college educated white women was the one that really swung the most, and I thought that was really fascinating to see um, you know, coming out of the, the the convention and the Republican side, Kizir Khan, they you know Trump had had was losing them, and that's this is a demographic that that Mitt Romney won by 20 percentage points in 2012. They historically, since like Eisenhower's time, have gone for Republicans. Um, then they swung back uh, to Trump after Kellyanne Conway took over, and she's like the Republican expert on electing women and are getting uh, the women's vote, and um, and she really. You know, char she she got him out there, like you know, doing campaigning in Detroit, proving that he wasn't racist. He, she got him out there uh, campaigning with his daughter and talking about women's issues. And by the time they were going into the first debate, they were they were tied. Um, oh, actually, no, he he was ahead with non-college educated white women, and they were tied overall in the polls. Then, of course, the groping allegations come around. They swing away, and then with Comey, they swung hard back, and he ended up winning them by 28 percentage points. It's a historic. A huge win. It's a, does it improves Romney's margin by eight percentage points, and they turned out in historic numbers for him. So, um, I thought that was really just interesting that that one demographic was the only demographic that consistently throughout the whole campaign swung back and forth between Hillary and Trump. So, I think there's definitely lessons to be learned there as well. Um, you know, in some ways, I, I'm sort of more interested uh, in this campaign in terms of the way masculinity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maleness really played out here with Donald Trump running as this uber alpha male uh, candidate who literally talked about the size of his penis uh, during the debate. You, you can't imagine <laughs> Hillary Clinton talking about, I don't know, her bra size or, <laughs> or something like that uh, on stage. So here he was. 
really, I think running as this unreconstructed man, right, from the 1950s uh, in a way that Mitt Romney was caricatured as by, uh, by Democrats uh, in, in 2012, but in a way that I think um, uh, Donald Trump embraced and embodied this year his nicknames for different candidates like Jeb Bush. Uh, he was low energy, which of course he really means he's low testosterone. Uh, <laughs> little Marco. Little Marco, <laughs> Rand Paul, you know, uh, I've had it up to here with you. Rand Paul jokes about uh, his height and stature and masculinity uh, ultimately. So, you know, coming into this race, the idea was that it would be Hillary Clinton who played uh, the, the gender card, uh, but really in, in Anyways, I thought it was it was Donald Trump who who played the gender card. We often think of gender in the same way we think of race as black people as the ones who have race uh, and and women as the ones who have a gender. But but I think uh, in this instance uh, it was very much uh, Donald Donald Trump who was playing the gender card. And I also think there was an interesting intersection here in terms of gender uh, and race in terms of Hillary Clinton. Uh, I think she ran really as probably the only Black Lives Matter candidate we've ever seen. She said Black Lives Matter. She embraced uh, talking about race in a way that even Obama didn't. Uh, and I don't know if you, got a, you guys have had a chance yet to read ta Coates' piece on uh, race yet. It just came out, or, or Obama. And one of the things uh, he talks about essentially is that Obama never really made uh, people feel bad about race. And I think with Hillary Clinton and talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, and, and being even a little bit more progressive and talking about race than Obama, I think uh, that had an effect in terms of the way people people thought about her, uh, and a negative effect in terms of some of these voters were talking about um, working class white women, working class white men. Uh, so we saw, I think, some intersectionality at play with, with Hillary Clinton not only being um, a woman, but in some ways uh, a candidate who was, I mean, not exactly blacker than Obama, but embracing racial rhetoric in a way that we hadn't seen from, from any candidate previously. So now we watch this race, and you know, I can't think of a campaign where there was a clearer you know, contrast between, as you say, this you know, masculine, there's just, he oozed machismo and he was kind of out there. We had all these, you know, finally a candidate with balls you would see on everybody's t shirt right. or um, the really insulting things at, you know, targeted at Clinton from his supporters. And then on the other side, you had a woman who was not just a woman, but who had spent most of her political um, life, especially early on, pursuing the rights of women and girls. And that's kind of what she was known for um, in the 90s and so on. And it turned out like this. So what does this, what kind of impact does this have going forward in terms of women wanting to run for office, people's concerns about gender politics from voters. I mean, I talked to people who study gender and politics before the race, and they were concerned that even if Hillary, you know, assuming that Hillary won, and she had a rough road, that it would discourage people from jumping in, more women from jumping into the ring. Kind of, where do you see this going? Um, you know, I, I, was, I was surprised because uh, at the, after the election, I thought interest in my book would die down because it's a book about women going into the workforce and I have a chapter on Hillary. And, and actually, I saw a huge surge of, of book sales. And I was talking to Debbie Walsh from uh, the Center for American Women in Politics um, last week at another event. And we were, and I was like, you know, have you seen a surge um, in this? And she was actually like, yeah, you know, they do a training, I think, in January every year. And like usually around this time, uh, maybe 10 people have signed up for 10 women interested in running for office and they've got like I think 80 or 90 women already signed up for that training. Um, so anecdotally, like talking to Emily's List, talking to other groups, um, even the Republicans on the Republican side, you see a huge surge of women run, interested in running for office, interested in these issues. And I think it has the potential, I mean, I, obviously it's a while before the next election, but it has the potential to be like another year of the women where, you know, <clears throat> Having the positive, like women gain, you know, women being elected to office has not seemed to stir more women running for office in the same way that the negative does, where it was the, the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings and, and the grilling of Anita Hill by the all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary Committee um, that really spurred thousands of women to run for office in 1992 and created the first year of women, where you saw the number of women in the Senate triple, the number of women in the House increased by 50%, thousands of women ran for 
for local offices. And so I think that you see this really activated, educated uh, women, who um, most of whom voted for Hillary, who felt that their votes were not registered and not heard, who are very, very like angry <laughs> about that. And, and they want to do something about it. And so I do think you are seeing a, an interesting surge. I don't know if whether, hopefully it'll continue and ride into the 2018 elections. The difference there is that, you know, 91, we were going to a presidential election in 92. This time around, it's a, an off year, 19, you know, 2018 is um, congressional elections, uh, which where tradition, traditionally women don't vote as much as they do in presidential years. So um, there are a lot of hurdles to really sustaining that momentum, but we'll see. I mean, I think it could be potentially a very interesting year for electing women. Yeah, I think that's right, because now the question is who's going to be the first woman president, right? Uh, and there are all sorts of predictions once once Obama uh, got elected and, and Gwen Ifill, uh, I would be remiss at not mentioning her. Uh, may she rest in peace. We all loved her. Uh, she wrote that fabulous book, uh, The Breakthrough, after Obama was elected and uh, chronicling sort of the next generation of uh, potential African-American senators and leaders and governors. And in many ways, a, a lot of those folks uh, flamed out and, and, and there weren't any coattails from Obama in terms of African-Americans necessarily rising through the ranks of politics. But I think with, with Hillary Clinton, because the ground is already there in some ways and there are folks in the Senate, folks in the House, folks in governor's mansions who can become uh, the, the first woman president. So, you know, we just had Maggie uh, Hassan here. Uh, you wonder about somebody like Kamala Harris, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and folks like that. Uh, the, the woman who's going to be the, the UN, uh, uh, oh, Nikki, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley in South so, Carolina. so, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is going to put a damper on, on folks at all. Uh, but, 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 but you do wonder, you you know, the tendency always, even in this election, uh, is to always to sort of look at the bench and, and where is the bench? Who yeah. are the unlikely candidates who we aren't thinking of, sort of the, the male or, or female version and Democrat version or Republican version of, of Donald Trump, who was a very unlikely candidate uh, and certainly not on any Republican uh, bench. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I think there, I mean, one of the things I think we learned in this uh, campaign is that well, the experts were wrong. I mean, I was wrong. The folks at CNN uh, were wrong. I, I hate to admit it, but I think about that every day. Uh, and there's this whole world of, of folks out there uh, who aren't always part of the conversation. Uh, and, and so likely there's somebody out there who we don't know, who we are thinking about, who, who is, is entering the pipeline and could make a real run. And as far as specific, like more strategic lessons learned, like if you were looking at a actual campaign. I mean, is there any lesson to be learned in terms of strategy or messaging or how to approach or what to take, you know, not to take so much yeah. for granted or what to do differently? I mean, you know, I think don't piss off Vladimir Putin. I mean, that might be one. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and you know that's the whole thing. I mean, we always go into this with sort of you know they're all the the political playbook, and, yeah. and even you know Barbara Lee has all of these the Barbara Lee Foundation has all of these ideas about what you have to do as a woman president and uh, or, or as a woman candidate. But but I think what we know is that the rules don't necessarily apply. Uh, it, but, but maybe it, it's also true, the rules don't apply uh, to men, but maybe they do apply even more uh, they really strictly. They apply. really apply now uh, to, women, to women. I mean, that might be a, a takeaway. Well, now here's um, kind of, a, not a partisan question, but going forward, you mentioned Nikki Haley. We just had a race. I had talked to Republican women for a few years, especially after Mitt Romney um, lost. and especially within the establishment, a lot of Republican women were working so hard yeah. to change the party's image mm -hmm. as not a friendly place for women. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that Trump did not necessarily forward that <laughs> goal all that well, although maybe he did, I yeah. don't know. He did, he did um, fine with women. So where does that leave that effort? Yeah. Or does it just send the message that it doesn't matter? You can win you know, with an unreconstructed Trump. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of challenges for Republican women, particularly in the House, uh, moving forward. So I had uh, lunch with Sarah Chamberlain from the Republican Main Mainstream Partnership a couple of weeks ago, and she said given the number of Republican women, first of all, they've lost a couple of seats, so they're down to, I think, 21 in the House right now, which is, what, less than 8% of, their, of, the, of, the, of, of the conference, which is just unbelievably bad compared to um, more than 60 Democratic women in the House. Um, 
And with all the retirements, you're going to see Kathy McMorris Rogers potentially go become Interior Secretary. There's a bunch of those women who are going to run for higher office in various states. Um, and you're potentially going to see the, the female representation for Republicans in the House reach like World War II levels. Right, like so, it's so bad that it's you're going to go under twenty. You're going to go maybe even to like close to fifteen, um, which is pretty much dismal. I mean, that's really awful, um, and that's tough. I mean, this is a group that really um, has had a hard time getting elected through Tea, tea Party primaries. For you know whether it's fair or not, women are perceived to be more moderate, um, and in, in order to get get through Tea Party primaries for Republican on the Republican side, it's been very hard for them, um, and 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 then and. Now, like obviously in the era of Trump, like all of the recommendations from the 2012 autopsy were completely upended, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and that has not that has sort of compounded the problem that, that they face with this. And obviously there are efforts, uh, like you know the Republican Main Street Partnership is one, but then also I think Christine Toretti has a group, uh, Brittany Thune has a group. I mean there's all these sort of efforts that are popping up on the right to try to help women through the primary process, but it's a very slow going process, and it's nowhere near the kind of Emily's list on the left where it they really clear primaries for you and they equip you to run for office and help you fundraise and do all these things. Now, do we have any sense yet of how the Trump administration will be, what kind of place it will be for women? I mean, from, from what you've seen with appointments or talking to people, I mean, do you have any sense yet, Neil? You know, I mean, everyone uh, talks about Ivanka Trump, right? Whenever you, you talk about women, and she, of course, gave that speech at the RNC uh, convention this summer where if you closed your eyes, you thought you were listening to a Democrat, right? And she to Hillary was, Clinton. Yeah, to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> uh, she was talking about family leave and how the Trump administration would be great uh, for, for women. Uh, and, and there's the story about Donald Trump handing the phone to Ivanka, I think when he was, when he, maybe it was Pelosi he was on the, on the phone with when she started to talk about uh, women's issues. Uh, so, I mean, I guess that's a sort of outsourcing there going on uh, with Ivanka. Uh, and the thing is, we don't know. I mean, if you look at the pics that are, are around him, uh, <laughs> immediately around him, not sure if Kellyanne Conway is going to get into the White House or not, or whether or not she's going to stay outside. So we don't know. I, I mean, can Ivanka push through some family leave policy uh, through this Congress? Um, I don't think we know. I mean, people obviously looking at abortion, defunding, Planned Parenthood. People forget how popular Planned Parenthood is. It's like one of the most popular uh, organizations in the country, far more popular than Congress, the press, <laughs> uh, Trump, and Obama combined, probably. Um, so I don't think we know. And that's the big that's the big thing. That was sort of the trick of of Donald Trump. You don't know. Like whatever you you know whatever you want, you, you can want kind of look at look him. at him and say, oh yeah, he's. He's going to be great at that uh, because that. Ivanka's standing next to him or, or whatever it is. So, uh, so, so, so the hopes of the nation are wrapped up in the in the new president's daughter. Yes, Ivanka, <laughs> who's lovely. Well, that's very soothing. Yeah. And I think with that, we're going to toss to anybody in the audience. And I think we have microphones on the move. Uh, right up front here. Hi, Ashley Bergman from the International Republican Institute. So as someone who works in international development, um, I work specifically to get women involved in the political life in their respective countries. My question is, what does this mean for us abroad? Um, and for those of us who work on women's empowerment abroad, especially in countries that look to us as an example, um, how does this affect our work in that field? Well, hopefully the takeaway message was not that you can grow up women and still get elected to office. I mean, that's that's like my hope. I don't know. Um, like it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's that's a tough one. Um, selling selling this yeah. abroad. It's um, I, I certainly have heard from a lot of um, from when I covered foreign policy and from a lot of my sources abroad. Um, very much concern uh, about this and and talking to ambassadors who are coming back who are you know, career foreign service, who are very sort of waiting to see uh, what this administration does before they decide they want to go be the public face of that um, you know, going abroad. And I think you might see a lot of upheaval in the foreign service. Um, but I mean, that's, that's always like a tough, tough job, especially if you're trying to sell something that you don't necessarily believe in and I but I don't know that we know yet what they believe in like you know like Neo was saying maybe he'll become like a major champion for paid family medical leave and ch paid child care like and that would be amazing we just don't know I mean like we'll see <laughs> hi 
Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Guapan. I actually worked for the Clinton campaign in Michigan. Um, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> My question actually goes to the post-election talk on the Democrat side has been a lot about moving away from identity politics. And I know Bernie Sanders actually wrote a piece saying that we need to focus more on economics and less on personal identity. So I was wondering, based on both your backgrounds, if you think that that's something that's practical to do, and if you think it will instead alienate who the Democrats already have on their side. No, I, I think it's it's a good question. Uh, I guess Bernie Sanders doesn't see Donald Trump as running a campaign based on white identity, right? And and you can argue that that's what he did, right? That he was uh, the, the the candidate of of white grievance politics and and talked about. Uh, race and identity in a way that we haven't seen any uh, candidate do over the last 20 or 30 years, whether it was him talking about uh, Muslims in a disparaging way or talking about people who live uh, in the inner city who, who go to the store and, and get or shot. Rapist. Yeah, Mexican or, or rapists. Uh, so, so, no, you know, I, I think, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, you know, is a, is a socialist, and, and socialism has never really accounted necessarily for race. And he had his own uh, kind of a racial education uh, during his his candidacy. So the idea that he's coming back now to um, that Democrats should re re reject identity uh, politics, I, I mean, it's a little odd. But I, but I do think that is going to be the big question. You can see that playing out uh, with the race for DNC. Is it uh, or even the race for for uh, the leader of, of Democrats in the House, right? Mm -hmm. Is it white identity politics, sort of Rust Belt identity and the working class, which when people say working class, they really mean the white working class? Uh, or is it somebody like Keith Ellison, right, who is more in the Obama mold, uh, more of a Black Lives Matter uh, candidate? I mean, I think we saw in both candidates play identity politics. It just worked better for, for Donald Trump because there are more white people uh, in, in the country. He did exceptionally well uh, with white people, ex exceptionally well uh, with white working class uh, folks. Uh, Hillary Clinton got 37% of the white vote. Uh, Obama got 39% in 2012 and something like 41% uh, in 2008. So you do see the declining foreign chins. Uh, for Democrats in terms of, of, of the white vote. So they do have to figure it out. But, but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think both played identity politics. It just, I think it just worked well, uh, better for, for Donald Trump. And, and uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't work as well for Democrats because the numbers uh, just weren't there. And I think, again, that Hillary Clinton ended up alienating uh, some of those uh, white voters who were uncomfortable with some of her rhetoric around race and gender. Yeah. I also will say that um, you know women make up 53% of the electorate, the voting electorate. We, on average, vote 10% more in presidential elections than men do. And you know, um, and I will quote Kellyanne Conway here in saying that it's not identity politics when you make up the majority of the electorate. <laughs> I think we have time for yeah. just one more. Oh, yeah, go brief. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Robin Leeds. I um, worked in the White House Women's Office under President Clinton back in the day. It seems like a long time ago. Uh, I wanted to raise two points and get your feedback. One is that we still don't live in a participatory democracy. I mean, when you look at the eligible electric, electorate and who's participating and who's not. And that's a population that we really have to embrace. Why aren't people voting in America? And why aren't people that will vote for um, women and democratic women voting in America? And we really need to take a closer look at our democracy and how it's not functioning. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to ask about too is, as a Jewish woman, um, sadly, I see a lot of parallels um, to the rise of fascism uh, in Germany and Europe. And I'm wondering if you see that, and if so, how that's playing out uh, in 2016. Which piece? Do you I'll take. Do? I'll take. I'll take the um, the representative democracy piece. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nobody wants to go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, yeah, supposed yeah. to bring up Germany or Nazi Germany in these things. Yeah. <laughs> First rule of moderate: you never bring up Hitler. Yeah. Or Nazi Germany. <laughs> 
Thanks. So, um, you know, I would say it's very hard to drive out millions and millions of new voters unless you're voting for something positive. So, um, and, you know, like, hatred of George W. Bush did not get John Kerry elected, and hatred of Barack Obama did not get Mitt Romney elected. Um, and I think to some degree, and a lot of the sort of autopsies of the campaigns have worn this out, um, Hillary Clinton bet a little bit too much on hatred of Donald Trump. Um, and she needed to present more of a positive, like here's like inspirational, hopeful message that got people out and got young people activated um, and, and inspired people. And I think it's very hard to get elected in, in, the, neg in the negative sense. And this was the most negative campaign I don't think in history, really. I mean, at least certainly in recent totally history. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, you know, that in itself is is pretty brutal. And, and yes, a lot of people did come out and vote. She won the popular vote by, I think, more than two and a half million right now. Um, but not enough people in the right places, like Michigan, um, came out and voted. And so, um, you need to. She needed to present more of a like a of a of I think a, a positive message in those places. And um, and I think that is a lesson that. We need to remember and and and, for, and, not, and and move forward is that it like whenever people try to get elected in the negative, it never works. You have to you know present some sort of hopey changey thing to quote mm -hmm. Sarah Palin that gets people you know inspired and on board and fired up and ready to go because if you don't have that then um, then it's really really hard. Yeah. I, I think that has to be the last. Yeah. One. Oh, sorry. Great. Well, thank I you. So saved by the bell. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> stay for a couple more hours. We'll talk about all yeah. kinds of things. Great. Thank you, Michelle. This well, is thanks. great. Thanks for coming, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Thanks.